So I'm primarily just going to talk about you know the Safe Drinking Water Act, what it does, um, its background, and you know I'm, I'm going to try to lay out sort of a, a few things, just what the process is in the Safe Drinking Water Act for regulating emerging drinking water contaminants. So you know there's a new contaminant that we're learning about, which is PFAS or cyanobacteria or algae blooms or, or something like that. You know, what's the, what does the Safe Drinking Water Act say about how we move from it's an unregulated contaminant to now one that all public water systems in the United States have to regulate and, and monitor for and, and limit in their drinking water systems? Then I'm going to talk about how EPA determines what thresholds to set those water regulations at. So once it's made a determination to regulate, how does it actually go about setting those drinking water standards? And lastly, the role that states play in all of this as sort of regulators beyond the things that sort of Catherine was talking about. Like, what are some of these, what, what are states doing to more aggressively regulate um, safe uh, drinking water contaminants in the, within their jurisdiction? Because you know, like many other sort of federal laws, you know, state governments can basically take up actions above and beyond the federal standards. And there are some, some cases where they're doing that. One thing I'll point out at the outset and then I'll circle back to, you know, drinking water, the Safe Drinking Water Act really regulates things from the water treatment plant through the distribution system to your tap. And so, you know, it's inherently focused on basically treating contaminants that might be coming into the water system, either from outside sources or from, you know, the drinking water infrastructure itself, as is the case with lead pipes. And so that's just important context and I'll come back to that sort of concept uh, towards the end. Next slide. So when we're talking about the framework in the Safe Drinking Water Act around, you know, the, the sort of framework that it created to regulate new contaminants, it's important to mention this outbreak in Milwaukee that happened in 1993, where essentially 100,000 people got sick and there were over 100 deaths, deaths from this cryptosporidium outbreak, which was an unregulated contaminant at the time. And, you know, as, as with all sort of major crises, you know, that spurred these major amendments in 1996 to the Safe Drinking Water Act. The intention of those amendments was really to make sure that EPA was taking seriously the issue of emerging contaminants in drinking water and basically not letting them go unregulated to the point where, you know, we have this major public health crisis with many, many deaths. And so, next slide. So this is the basic framework that was laid out by Congress in 1996 and those amendments. So once again, it's basically aimed at, you know, removing EPA discretion, making sure that they're regularly addressing unregulated contaminants, and also making sure that, you know, they're keeping an eye on contaminants that they've already regulated. And so, the, the basic framework here is that there's a contaminant candidate list, that base, there's an unregulated contaminant monitoring rule, then there's required regulatory determinations. And so I'm going to go into more detail sort of on each of those, these components today. Next slide. So in terms of making a determination as to whether to regulate a contaminant, the EPA basically is required to create national primary drinking water regulations for contaminants that meet three basic criteria. They have to have an adverse impact on the health of persons. They have to be known or substantially likely to occur in public water systems in a manner that presents a hazard to public health. And there has to be a meaningful opportunity for health risk reduction. So those are basically the criteria that EPA is considering under the Safe Drinking Water Act to determine basically what contaminants are regulated and what aren't. And so right Right now, we have 87 national primary drinking water regulations. There, there are more contaminants than that. You know, I've seen lists that go you know, as high as 150, sometimes even more than that. But you know, we currently have 87 national primary drinking water regulations. Next slide. So this is just a useful slide just to get used to sort of navigating right federal uh, or state regulations. You know, generally, you know, our national primary drinking water regulations are broken down into a number of classes of contaminants. So we have, you know, disinfectants, inorganic chemicals, organic chemicals, radionuclides. You know, this is really just helpful so that if you ever want to really go and look at monitoring requirements in particular, 
those are typically designated for a class of contaminants, not for each individual contaminant. So for example, you know, you'll see radionuclides has monitoring requirements for its class. Same with organic chemicals, same with inorganic chemicals. And so it's just sort of something to help you get used to sort of how this is organized in your federal and state regulatory codes if you want to go looking. Next slide. So here's a more detailed sort of description of the process that sort of I went over just a few slides ago for establishing drinking water standards. And I'm going to talk about sort of each of these steps in depth, but I want to just sort of provide you with an overview at the front end so you can see where we're going. And it's really broken down into four stages. It's the investigation stage for emerging contaminants, termination stage, basically determining whether to regulate or not, the rulemaking stage so that if there's been a determination to regulate, you know, actually creating those standards. And then there's the review phase. And that's basically you know, a requirement to review drinking water standards you know, every six years. And so you can see this is all stuff that's laid out in the Safe Drinking Water Act. It's sort of very detailed, very process oriented. There's strict timelines. Once again, this is all because you know, there was that massive outbreak in Milwaukee. Congress wanted to make sure that EPA was basically staying on track to regulating emerging contaminants as they came up. And so a lot of this is sort of geared towards that purpose. Next slide. So let's start with the investigation phase and we'll, we'll work our way through sequentially. So there's really two sort of key things at the investigation phase. There's the contaminant candidate list of the CCL and the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule. And so the, the contaminant candidate list is basically a list of unregulated contaminants that are known or anticipated to occur in public water systems, and may require regulation, but are currently unregulated. So the last one had 109 contaminants. And you know, there are important ways to get involved here. The, the EPA has to update this list every five years, and it has to provide that list for public notice and comment. And the next one is due sort of in late 2021, although as we'll talk about it in, later in my presentation, the EPA has missed these deadlines very frequently, so it may actually be quite later than that. Uh, the other way to get involved in the CCL, the contaminant candidate list, is to nominate contaminants for that list. You know, that opportunity typically becomes before it's released for public comment. The unregulated um, contaminant monitoring rule is basically a rule that requires water systems to monitor for drinking water contaminants that are currently unregulated. And so currently that list is 30 contaminants. That's the maximum amount that's allowed under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Once again, that list also has to be updated every five years and has to be provided for public notice and comment. And the next one is due around the same time as the CCL. You can go to the next slide. So after sort of that initial investigation stage, then there's this determination stage. And that's where basically EPA is required by the Safe Drinking Water Act to make a regulatory determination for at least five contaminants on the contaminant candidate list every five years. So once again, this is Congress basically saying, EPA, we want you to basically stay on top of this. We want you to make sure that you're, you're making a regulatory determination for five contaminants every five years. And so you can see sort of every regulatory determination that's been made you know, since those 1996 amendments. Um, and you know, mostly, as you see, determinations not to regulate. You know, most recently, we had sort of preliminary determinations to regulate two PFAS chemicals, the PFAS and PFAS. And, but you know, most of the time, we're seeing re determinations not to regulate. You can also see the number of comments that are made once these uh, preliminary regular determinations come out. You know, not that many, um, in not many from environmental groups. We see a lot of comments from like, the American Water Works Association, other Water Works Associations, you know, people like that. Next slide. All right, so say e EPA has made a determination to regulate. Or what, what's the, sort of the standards look like? Really, it's two types of standards that we're talking about. We're talking about maximum contaminant levels and treatment techniques. Maximum contaminant levels are basically, you know, a threshold limit that describes in milligrams per liter, you know, the amount of a contaminant that's allowed to be present in drinking water. And most of our drinking water standards are these maximum contaminant levels, or MCLs. There's an alternative option 
if establishing that threshold level is economically or technically infeasible, then the EPA can establish what's called a treatment technique. Now, a treatment technique is basically not saying, you know, here's the level that you have to make sure water is at, or, you know, it's a, it's a violation. It's instead saying, here's how you should treat your water. Here's how you should sort of basically control your water to make sure that, you know, it's, it's basically meeting EPA standards. And so there's not a ton of treatment techniques, but there are some big ones. The lead and copper rule, which regulates lead and drinking water, is a key uh, treatment technique. And then it's also very common in the microorganism class for basically drinking water bacteria, things like Legionella, stuff like that. And it's basic, those are widely used to, to regulate that class of contaminants. Next slide. So in terms of the actual rulemaking, like how, how that standard is set, how you set that threshold, how you set that treatment technique, it's basically this two-step process. The first step is setting the maximum contaminant level goal. That's the level at which no known anticipated adverse health effects occur, allowing for an adequate margin of safety. But that is an unenforceable standard. So for example, the maximum contaminant level goal for lead is zero because we know that no safe level of lead in drinking water. But that level is once again unenforceable standard. The next step is then, you know, where the actual essentially enforceable standard comes in. And that standard has to be set at the level that is as close to that goal as feasible, but taking into account the best technology, treatment techniques, as well as costs. So, you know, when we're looking at MCLs or treatment techniques, they're not always, you know, health-based standards. You know, sometimes what we see is we see an MCL, we see a maximum contaminant level goal, and then a, and then a maximum contaminant level or treatment technique that basically is above that goal. Um, but I will say most of the time when you look at what the MCLG is compared to the MCL, those numbers do line up for many contaminants. But there are obviously some big exceptions to that, lead being a big one. You know, obviously there, there is an amount of lead that's allowable in the drinking water system despite the MCLG, the maximum contaminant level goal being set at zero. Next slide. So once a standard is set, then there's this requirement to review all drinking water standards every six years. And basically what EPA is reviewing these standards for is to determine whether there are risks to human health that are posed by those regular, regu regulated contaminants that it hasn't you know, thought of before. And you know, the candidates for revision are there on your right, and it's basically, you know, they're a, a contaminant, it is a candidate for revision if there is a meaningful opportunity to improve the level of public health or achieve cost savings. Uh, and so there are a whole bunch of ways that a contaminant might not be appropriate for revision. And I'll point out that you know, the next six year results are anticipated in early 2023. So we have a bit to go on that. Next slide. So I just wanted to run through a couple of examples of how this process has actually functioned for uh, some contaminants. So one example is, is PFAS. Um, so notably, it was two PFAS were put on the 2009 contaminant candidate list, uh, and then you know a number, a few more were put on the 2012 unregulated contaminant monitoring rule. And so at that point, water systems throughout the United States had to start monitoring in their water systems for those PFAS. And then in 2016, we saw EPA issued a health advisory level for two specific PFAS. Now, a quick note on health advisory levels. That's typically a step that EPA will take for essentially emerging contaminants that aren't regulated yet, but they haven't made a regulatory determination on. It's basically sort of an unenforceable advisory level um, that lays out this, this is the level that EPA believes some health impacts may, may start to occur. It's typically very helpful for states that are looking at maybe regulating things a bit quicker, regulating an emerging can, contaminant a bit quicker than you know, the EPA, because it gives sort of some sense of authority for you know, setting a, an MCL for that, that specific contaminant. And so, we had that for P two PFAS in particular in 2016, and now, you know, just this year, EPA has proposed a re preliminary determination to regulate those two same PFAS uh, that were on that contaminant candidate list back in 2009. 
But you can see, you know, a long process. And once again, we, we just had a preliminary determination to regulate. You know, we haven't even gotten to arguing about, you know, essentially what that standard is going to be. Next slide. So here's another example of how this has worked for cyanobacteria. They were, uh, cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins have been included in each of the four contaminant candidate lists starting in 1998. In 2015, EPA issued a health advisory for two specific cyanotoxins. And then in 2016, EPA included 10 cyanotoxins in its unregulated contaminant monitoring rule. But as of yet, EPA has basically not proposed any regulatory determination. So it hasn't decided it's going to regulate, but it hasn't decided it's not going to regulate cyanobacteria or any cyanotoxins. It's basically you know, still sitting on that contaminant candidate list. Next slide. So I it partially set it up this way. I talked a lot about the process, how much Congress amended it in 1996, and how, how important it was for the EPA to be more on top of things. This, the short of it is, it hasn't really worked out that way. Since 1996, EPA has basically decided to regulate one unregulated contaminant, and it wasn't even really through that process. In 19, it, it, they made a regulatory determination in 2011 to regulate perchlorate, and you know that you'll notice that was never on the contaminant candidate list. And so that, but they made that determination in 2011. They proposed an MCL for that contaminant in 2019. And then since 1996, the, the other question is how many MCLs or treatment techniques is, is the, is, have been significantly revised? You know, basically one contaminant to date, you know, we have the total coliform rule, the regulatory determination to amend that rule was made in 20, 2003, then the proposed revisions came into place in 2013. So we obviously have some other contaminants that are out there that are sort of the EPA is weighing either revisions to or new standards for, you know, PFAS being one, key revisions for the lead and copper rule have been proposed. But so far, the short of it is EPA has decided to regulate one unregulated contaminant since 1996. It's only revised one uh, treatment technique um, or MCL since 1996. Next slide. So you may be also asking, you know, okay, they're not establishing, you know, new uh, drinking water regulations. Are they at least, you know, following the process that was laid out by Congress? And the short of it is, you know, they've been really behind on that as well. You know, the contaminant candidate list must be updated every five years. That's regularly published late, sometimes by several years. Same with those regulatory determinations. Um, that has to be made every for at least five contaminants on the contaminant candidate list every five years. The EPA has missed every deadline by at least two years, and so it's it's become a big problem. Um, and it's basically sort of I think frustrated a lot of the the purpose of those 1996 Safe Drinking Water Act amendments. 